Haven Arrest Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson Number 12, Sunday, November 18, 2018. The lesson is entitled The Great Flood. The lesson text comes from Genesis chapter 7, verses 11 through 24. Related scriptures are Exodus chapter 14, verses 27 through 31, Isaiah 24, 1 through 3, Matthew 24, 34 through 42, 2 Peter 3, 3 through 7. The place is unknown and the time is unknown. This week in our lesson, we learn about the total devastation brought about the whole earth by the flood. It is possible that some of your students may be skeptical that such a worldwide flood occurred. But the biblical narrative is very clear in its precise detail and very, convinc and, and very convincingly true. Today's aim, facts, to show the devastation that came upon the earth from the great flood during Noah's time. Principle, to remember that what God tells us will always come to pass. Application. To know that when God shows us something that is coming, we had better listen to him or face the consequences of being unprepared. Illustrating the lesson. We can be certain that what God says will happen. Practical points. One. God allows men and women time to repent because he is gracious. Genesis 7, 11. Two. God places limits on the severity of his judgment because he is gracious, verses 12. 3. Obedience demonstrates our faith and places us in God's protection, verses 13 through 14. 4. God's hand preserves and sustains that which he creates, verses 15 through 16. 5. God is holy and cannot tolerate or compromise with sin, Verses 17 through 20. Six, if a man does not repent, his sin ruins everything it touches. Verses 21 through 22. Seven, sin brings death while faith in God gives life. Verses 23 through 24. Golden text. Every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. Genesis seven twenty three. Today we have two lesson outlines. The first is coming of the flood, Genesis seven eleven through sixteen. The second is devastation of the flood, Genesis seven seventeen through twenty four. Introduction. A recent news report showed the devastating approach and passing of a tsunami in Japan. It was filmed by someone standing on a high balcony in a city close to the ocean shore. People were shown one minute going about their business on a city street and the next minute fleeing for their lives as a huge wave suddenly bore down on them. It is different to have rain that gradually causes an accumulation of water. A woman who lived through the flooding of a hurricane described how she noticed water in her front yard early one morning, then went back to sleep, only to be awakened by a friend calling to alert her to danger around her house. Water was four inches from her doorstep, and she ended up losing everything she owned. Coming of the Flood, Genesis 7, 1. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. Verse 12. And the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. Verse 13. In the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Jebeth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. Verse 14. They and every beast after his kind and all the cattle after their kind 
in every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, in every fowl after his kind, in every bird of every sort. Verse 15. And they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. Verse 16. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Onslaught of water. Genesis 7, 11 through 12. The flood of Noah's day might have been a devastating, a fascinating combination of these two scenarios because of the two sources of water involved. It was in Noah's 600th year, on the 17th day of the second month of the year, that all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. All at once, two things began to happen at the same time with water appearing from both above and below the earth's surface. The phrase, fountains of the great deep, indicates that waters came gushing up like springs from a huge subterranean abyss. The Believer's Study Bible notes, the fountains of the great deep refers to springs, while deep is the same word as the vast and almost infinite deep at creation. Chapter 1, verse 2. The word for broken up could also be translated split, ripped open. This was an unexpected eruption never before witnessed by mankind. At the same time, the windows of the heavens were open, indicating torrential rains. Many believe God had placed a canopy of water around his creation. The waters which were above the firmament in Genesis 1-7, protecting the earth in a greenhouse type of environment and contributing to the longevity of people prior to the flood. It was at this point in time that God opened that canopy and dumped the water onto the earth. What makes this a probability is that is the fact that lifespans were significantly reduced after the flood. This deluge of water continued for 40 days and 40 nights. We will see in a few more verses what the extent of coverage was from all of this. Everything about this explanation points to a universal flood covering the entire surface area of the earth. Safety in the ark. Genesis 7, 13-14. The tremendous importance of this event is emphasized by the degree of repetition of the information related to, to it. Verse 13 begins with the phrase, in the self-same day, which is a repeat of the information in verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. After this, there is a repeat of what is found in verse 7. Once again, we are told that on a certain specific day, Noah and his family entered the ark. Unlike in the previous instance, however, this time the sons are named. Neither Noah's wife nor his son's wives are ever named, even though they were obviously being cared for by God just as much as the men were. This again points to the male-dominated culture in the ancient world, but in no way does it make the women any less important or valuable in God's eyes. The New Testament clearly shows Christianity elevating women. It is encouraging to see that God was and is concerned about the entire family. This is also emphasized in the New Testament, seen in passages like Ephesians 5, 20 through, 22 through chapter 6, verse 4, where God gave specific instructions through Paul about the conduct of family relationships. It is also implied in Paul's respectful mention of Timothy's godly grandmother and mother, 2 Timothy 1.5. We are also informed about the entrance of the animals into the ark, Genesis 7.14. 
All of them are included in the terms beast, cattle, creeping things, fowl, and bird of every sort. These terms include wild and domesticated animals along with everything that crawls and everything that flies. God's command and protection, Genesis 7, 15 through 16. We noted in an earlier lesson that Noah would not have had to scamper all over the earth chasing these animals toward the ark. God would have directed them there. That is clearly brought out here. For the text says that they went in unto Noah into the ark. Verse 15 states that they were in pairs two and two. And verse 16 specifies that they were male and female. God made provision for the continuation of all life even while destroying it. The pairs of animals represented all creatures that had the breath of life in them. This is a reminder that bodies are lifeless without breath and that all breath comes from God. It takes us back to the creation of Adam in Genesis 2-7, where we are given the details of the process that took place. First, the Lord God formed a man of the dust of the ground, after which he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. As a result, man became a living soul. Life has great value because it is a gift from God that we should never take lightly. This is especially true of human life, but we should recognize it also in the animal kingdom. Proverbs 12.10 states, A righteous man regardeth the life of his beast, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. There is no more excuse for the abuse of animals than there is the murder of a fellow human being. Genesis 7.16 notes that the animals entered the ark as God had commanded, Noah giving him credit for it. This is appropriate for he was the one who made provision for them. After all of them were safely inside, God shut the door of the ark, again emphasizing Noah's role. Shut him in devastation of the flood verse 17 and the flood was 40 days upon the earth and the waters increased and bare up the ark and it was lift up above the earth verse 18 and the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth and the ark went upon the face of the waters verse 19 and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Verse 20, 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. Verse 21, and all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man. Verse 22, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life. Of all that was in the dry land died. Verse 23. And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowl of the heaven. And they were destroyed from the earth. And, and Noah only remained alive. And they that were with him in the ark. Verse 24. And the waters prevailed upon the earth an hundred and fifty days. Increasing waters. Genesis 7, 17 through 18. Imagine nonstop pouring rain for 40 days in a row. Gradually, all ponds and lakes would overflow, followed by cresting rivers. Before long, oceans would reach beyond their boundaries and spread until all the earth's surface was covered. That, however, would just be the beginning as the water continued to get deeper and deeper. People and animals alike would seek higher ground, going farther and farther up into the hills and soon climbing the mountains. We can only imagine the panic that was began to grow in the hearts of the people, getting worse and worse as the rain continued and the water rose higher and higher. It is probable that those in the vicinity of the ark desperately cried out and crawled at the structure with hopes of getting inside. It was too late for them, 
of course, so they were all left to the deepening waters. Here is a portrait of the hopelessness that will accompany those in eternity without Jesus as their savior. When the water became deep enough, the ark started to float. It would have taken some time because of its size and weight, but eventually it began to sway and lift off the surface of the earth. Before long, it was fully afloat and moving in the water. The fact that the ark floated safely on the surface of the water tells us that what Noah had built was completely seaworthy with no danger of capsizing or sinking. God had given him the perfect proportions of length, width, and height for staying afloat. The day Noah had warned about for over 100 years finally arrived. God always fulfills his word, but he always allows time for repentance before the punishment. And even greater destruction is coming in the future for those who do not know him. It would be wise for anyone who have not received Jesus to pay attention to his warnings. Prevailing Waters, Genesis 7, 19 through 20. We are told in verse 18 that as waters increased, they prevailed. In verse 19, this reality is emphasized. The word translated prevailed is the Hebrew word gabar, meaning to be mighty or have strength. A related form designates a mighty man of valor. Judges 6, 12, 11, 1, 1 Kings 11, 28. A person who prevails in battle or in spiritual endeavors in the strength of the Lord. Use of the flood waters. The verb viv vividly pictures an unstoppable force overwhelming everything in its path. We saw in Genesis 7, 18, that the waters were increased greatly upon the earth, while in verse 19, the statement is made that they prevailed exceedingly upon the earth until all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. This is confirmed in verse 20. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. Twenty-two feet of water covered the highest mountain peaks, easily allowing the ark to float over them. The author implies that the highest waters covered the Arafat mountain range, the height of which is approximately 16,000 feet, chapter 8, verse 4. Surely a flood more than three miles in depth could not be confined to any portion of the earth. The Hebrew word kol, used twice in the verse translated all and the whole, adds to the impression that the flood was a universal phenomenon. No one could have escaped the catastrophe except those in the ark. Total Destruction, Genesis 7, 21 through 23a. Here is a summary of the extent of death caused by the flood. Outside of marine life, everything living, everything living died. The emphasis here is on everything that lived on the earth, all creatures that had the breath of life, and everything that normally existed on dry land. The repeated absolutes, all flesh died, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, all that was in the dry land, and every living substance leave no exceptions. If any person or animal tried to survive at the beginning of the rain by clinging to a piece of floating debris, and if by some outside chance some pocket of air was discovered somewhere in a cave, the hope of safety soon disappeared and was replaced with destruction. Water covering everything to the point of being high above the highest mountain peaks would run into everything that might provide temporary safety. There was absolutely no escape for anything living on the face of the earth. There is a parallel here with the day when unsaved people appear before the great white throne. In the book of Revelation, John described that day, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. 
and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And whosoever was not found in written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Chapter 20, verse 12, and, cha and verse 15. It is impossible to overemphasize the importance of being ready to meet God. Our lives are not meant merely for personal enjoyment and achievement. Throughout life, we are given the opportunity to receive Jesus as personal Savior, and that is the only guarantee of heaven. As often as we might hear that, and as trite as it might begin to sound, it is the truth we must accept. Provision amid the cataclysm. Genesis 7, 23b through 24. A final emphatic point of comparison is made in the statement that Noah and those with him in the ark remained alive. It is a stark contrast. Everything outside the ark on the face of the earth died, but those inside the safety of the ark remained alive. Once again, we see a type of Christ presented by this ark. Though there are many who tell us that all religions lead to heaven, this is not the truth represented in the scriptures. Jesus is the only way to eternal life in heaven. One day, Jesus explained to his disciples that his father's house had many man, many dwelling places in it and that he was going there to prepare it for them, John 14, 2. Thomas said, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Verse 5, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Verse 6. The risk in ignoring this statement has eternal consequences, just as the ignoring of Noah's warnings for so many years did in his day. Genesis 7.24 closes our lesson with the observation that the waters prevailed upon the earth in 150 days. For five months, the waters continued to rage and rise higher unto, until they covered everything. According to Genesis 8, 3-4, they must have then begun to slowly recede. Noah had entered the ark in the second month of his 600th year, 711, and the ark did not come to rest until the seventh month, 8-4. Questions. 1. What two sources of water brought about the flood? 2. In which year of Noah's life did the rains begin, and how long did they continue? 3. What might the, the repetition of information on who entered the ark be telling us? 4. What categories of animals were included in the ark, and how did they get there? Five, why is Noah given credit for gathering all the animals? Six, what happened to the ark as the waters began to rise? Seven, how are the waters portrayed in the word prevailed? Genesis 7, 19. Eight, how high above the mountain peaks did the water rise? Nine, what strong contrast is underscored in verse 23? 10. How is the ark a type of Christ and what is the warning for today? This concludes the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, November 18, 2018. Thank you for listening. God bless.